professor of history when I arrived at the history department at Mona 43 years ago. <laughs> and of course, Ken, who was also in the history department, uh, professor of history also. So we are surrounded by historians. So we have to do a little bit of historicizing, which is important, because those days in the 70s were at best described as divisive, because this region, our region, we have some big choices to make. And uh, the notion that we were still attached to the colonial scaffold, even though many of our countries had become independent, there was still the power of the colonial ethos uh, holding back the advance, the advanced trajectory of where we wanted to go and what we wanted to be. And I can assure you that there was no area of civic society where this conflict was better displayed than in the arena of education. Education. How do, we, how do we come to terms with what was clearly a colonial education system and process? And how do we launch our children and grandchildren into an arena of national, regional, historical studies and social studies based on the comprehension <coughs> of their own domestic reality. Those were interesting days and CXC emerged within that context. When I returned to the Caribbean in 79 and came here to Jamaica, the debate was still raging. The debate was still raging. That this CXC thing is going to undermine education, perfectly good education in the Caribbean. And this movement towards examinations, local examinations, is going to be a, a dumbing down of, of education. The jury was still out. It was still raging back then, which speaks to the, the power of three, four hundred years of colonial domination. It was a long experience with colonialism, and we were just getting our heads lift, to lift above all of that to see, to see a different future. So that's the historian's part of it. I am here to say a few words as chairman today, because my task is to assist the institution in going into the future, even more so. We are perfectly clear about the historical past. What we have to do now is to focus and lead this institution into an even more glorious future. We have all the skills to do that. We have the consciousness. We have the public support. And we are, as we would say, batting on a good wicket at this time. And um, we were tested, as you know, in the COVID pandemic, we were truly tested. Across the region, we were tested. But we faced the facts. We examined the reality facing our communities, our families, our schools, our children. We looked at it fully in the eye and we made some good decisions to get through that period. And now we have to continue to do that, always to be vigilant, to be agile, and to do what is in the best of the children and the families of this region. So we are focused very much uh, on the future as we historicize. So Mr. Chairman, you should never say to a historian, you have five minutes. <laughs> it's always, always a danger that something might go wrong. Thank you very much. Thank you. And despite the difficulty, we truly thank you, Sir Hillary, for making use of the five minutes. Professor Sir Hillary Beckles is Vice Chancellor of the University of the West Indies. He's an academic, an international thought leader, a United Nations Committee official, 
and global public activist in the field of social justice and minority empowerment. Sir Hillary continues to serve as a director of several regional and international organizations. It is no wonder then that Sir Hillary is so passionate about the future of CXC. We thank you, Sir Hillary. At this time, from one CXC giant to another, we will invite our registrar and CEO of CXC, Dr. Wayne Wesley, to deliver remarks. Dr. Wesley, in his capacity, leads CXC in its new strategic plan implementation, carefully maneuvering and facilitating strategic external linkages, transformation, and international and internal development. Dr. Wesley is passionate about regional integration and development, particularly fostering human capital development through education and training. A Fulbright Scholar, Dr. Wesley holds a PhD in inter Industrial Engineering from Florida State University. He's a Chartered Manager and a Fellow of the Chartered Management Institute of the United Kingdom. Dr. Wesley, we welcome your remarks. Thank you very much, Travis. <clears throat> Sorry. Professor, the most honorable Kenneth Hall, past chairman of the Caribbean Examinations Council, Professor Sir Hilary Beckles, our current chairman, and Sir Roy, past chairman of the Caribbean Examinations Council, Mrs. Maureen Dwyer, Permanent Secretary Acting, other Permanent Secretaries online and listening to us today, our distinguished pioneers, Professor Neville Ying, Ms. Irene Walters, Mr. Cliff Hughes, our distinguished student to I told him that coming here today, I would actually print his certificate and have it on display. One of our very first to have written the exam in 1979 to moderate our sessions today. Thank you very much. Members of staff, our pro registrar, and members of the executive team, senior management and staff, members of council listening online, members all over, students, accept greetings this morning. The pleasure is mine to bring, oh, bring remarks to this auspicious occasion. Standing in the presence of these stalwarts is certainly a moment that you just can't imagine and create in any sphere of life quite easily. CXC, we are at 50, represents the Council's celebration of Thanksgiving, honoring the past, recognizing the present, and visioning the future. Today's event, CXC at 50, the Pioneer's Viewpoint, provides us with an opportunity, an extraordinary opportunity, to share in the conversation with some visionary pioneers who contributed to the establishment of the Caribbean Examinations Council. 50 years ago, a body of pioneers set out to achieve one ambitious goal, driven by a passion for Caribbean excellence, a firmly rooted belief that one can be more if one dares to try. This group of Caribbean educators envisioned the first examinations body of the Caribbean, by the Caribbean, and for the Caribbean. Today, 
CXC is hailed as one of the finest success stories of the Caribbean people, working together to enrich the region. In 1972, the agreement establishing the Council was signed in Barbados by the governments of 15 English-speaking Caribbean territories. The signing of the supplementary agreement in 1973 created an administrative and operational center in Jamaica called the Western Zone Office. The Council held its first meeting under the chairmanship of Dr. and later knighted Sir Roy Marshall, the then Vice Chancellor of the University of the West Indies in Barbados, commencing the 50-year journey of the Council to this day. Today, CXC comprises 16 participating countries, Anguilla, Antigua and Barbuda, Barbados, Belize, British Virgin Islands, Cayman Islands, Dominica, Grenada, Guyana, Jamaica, Montserrat, St. Vincent and the Na and Navies, St. Lucia, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Trinidad and Tobago, Turks and Caicos Island, and the organization also collaborates with countries in the Dutch Caribbean, such as Curaçao, Sabre, St. Eustatius, and St. Martin, as well as Suriname. We recognize the contribution, we recognize the contribution of those who serve the Caribbean Examination Council over the years. Firstly, the dedicated staff, past and current, teachers and administrators, and in fact, in my discussion with Sir Roy, he really wanted us to pay close attention to teachers and senior administrators who, during that period, did a lot of work, and I'm quite sure Professor Ying will speak to that, in ensuring that the Caribbean Examinations Council was established. Local, local registrars, examining committees, moderators, subject panels, national committees, members of council, ministries of education who have committed their time and energy in ensuring the council delivers on its regional mandate to the Caribbean people, providing examinations and syllabuses of the highest quality. Chairman Sir Roy Marshall from 1974 to 1975, Dr. Dennis Irving from 19, and uh, Sir Roy was a uh, Barbadian. Dr. Dennis Irving from 1975 to 1979, Jamaican. Mr. A.Z. Preston, Jamaican, 1979 to 1986. The Honorable Sir Roy Ogier, 1987 to 1996, St. Lucian. The Most Honorable Professor Kenneth Hall, 2002 to 2006, Jamaican. Professor E. Nigel Harris, 2006 to 2015, Guyanese. Professor Hilary Beckles, 2015 to 2019. Major Rodolph Daniel, Registrar, 1973 to 1977, Barbadian. Mr. Wilfeld Beckles, 1978 to 1993, Barbadian. Miss Irene Walters, 1994 to 1998, Jamaican. Dr. Lucy Stewart, 1998 to 2007, Trinidadian. Dr. Didicus Jules, 2008 to 2014, St. Lucian. Mr. Glenroy Comerbatch, 2014 to 2019, Barbadian, and yours truly, the current registrar, Jamaican. Irene has the pleasure of being both registrar and pro-registrar. She served as pro-registrar 
1974 to 1993. Mrs. Marcia Stewart was appointed officer in charge at the time no registrar was in place. We have Jennifer Cheeseman, 1997. We have Faye Saunders, officer in charge, again, vacancy existed. Dr. Stafford Griffith, 1999 to 2005, Guyanese. Wesley Barrett, 2005 to 2009, Jamaican. Glenroy Comabach also served as pro registrar 2015 to 2021. And now we have Dr. Eduardo Ali, 2021 to present, Trinidadian serving as our current pro registrar. These are stalwarts on whose shoulders we stand. 50 years ago, our founding fathers had the insight to make sure and saw the need for unity among us to overcome a common challenge of education system, of our education system to become regionally relevant to our culture, economy, systems of government, and our identity as a Caribbean people. We look forward to the future. CXC is transforming for greater regional impact. Accordingly, our vision is to become a digitally transformed enterprise, providing quality, relevant, and globally recognized educational services. It is envisioned that CXC will continue to remain relevant to regional development within the construct of an inclusive, flexible, and progressive assessment framework that allows for certification and recognition of critical competencies attained by candidates to become productive citizens of the region engaging the global economy. Our discussion this afternoon, or this morning, brings focus in highlighting the foundation which was laid. CXC at 50, honoring the past, recognizing the present, and visioning the future. May God continue to bless the Caribbean Examinations Council, our noble institution. We thank you, Dr. Wesley. Really appreciate your remarks. Now, if you know little or a lot about CXC, you understand the importance of the Ministry of Education. And today we are pleased to have with us representation from the Ministry of Education and Youth here in Jamaica by way of the Acting Permanent Secretary. Now, Mrs. Dwyer, we're just going to ask you to allow us to properly introduce you. We know you're ready to share your remarks with us, and we really look forward to hearing your remarks. Now, Mrs. Maureen Dwyer is the per acting permanent secretary in the Ministry of Education and Youth, Jamaica. Prior to assuming responsibility for that office in October 2021, Mrs. Dwyer worked in her substantive role as the chief executive officer and chief inspector of schools in Jamaica during the past 10 years, during the previous 10 years. She has over 35 years experience in the delivery and evaluation of educational services in Jamaica and the Caribbean. Mrs. Dwyer has served as a classroom teacher, education planner, territorial education officer, and Chief Inspector of Jamaican Schools. In recent years, Mrs. Dwyer assumed the chairmanship of a Caribbean Community Task Force, working on the development of a regional basic education quality management system for the 15 member states. Additionally, she has contributed to school improvement and quality assurance projects in Grenada, Antigua, Suriname, St. Kitts and Nevis, and Guyana. The focus of Mrs. Dwyer's work is the evaluation of standards, conducting external reviews, and providing policy advice to the education system in Jamaica. Her purpose? To promote excellence, accountability, and to advocate for change and improvement 
in education. Do you then wonder why we are pleased to have Mrs. Dwyer with us today? Ladies and gentlemen, please invite me in welcoming Mrs. Maureen Dwyer. Thank you so much, Travis. It was worth the wait. <laughs> Moderator, pioneering student, Mr. Hughes. Sir Kenneth Hall, Sir Hillary, Sir Roy Roger, and forgive me if I seem a little giggly because the only A I got in O levels was in history. How could I forget the making of the West Indies? <laughs> yes. Other permanent secretaries online in or other territories territories in the Caribbean, sorry, members of CXC, both online and here, Dr. Wayne Wesley, Dr. Eduardo Ali, or registrar and pro-registrar, other education officers, and of course, the staff, the general staff at CXC, uh, OEC members, welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, it certainly is my pleasure and honor to come here today as we celebrate with our pioneers. I bring you greetings on behalf of the Ministry of Education and Youth, and I want to congratulate CXC, the institution, but I must, more than anything else, congratulate the visioners the pioneers, the persons who had confidence that it could happen. I want to say a special thank you to those present and those who may be listening online. So 50 years in the life of any organization is really a significant milestone and a time to stop to recognize our successes and also to reflect, contributing to educational development in the Caribbean for 50 years is by any means a really outstanding accomplishment. And I want to congratulate you. It is fair and reasonable to say that as the value of education in this knowledge economy increases in a highly competitive world, qualifications and certification become even more high stakes, so to speak. So from its inception, CXC has been a very inclusive organization, and much of its work is carried out by a multi-layered network of Caribbean resources, not just by small staff in Barbados or Jamaica, but it really is a joined up effort in a genuine way. CXC is an excellent example of Caribbean institution building. CXC is an institution of CARICOM that is interested in effective longevity and functioning. Sorry, I missed my, my line. And indeed, not only has CXC emerged as a vital link in the regional integration movement, but it has also built a reputation as one of the most critical pillars in the region's education architecture. So, it's a model of regional cooperation in practice. I acknowledge the focus of this morning's function, CXC at 50, the pioneer's viewpoint, and I encourage you to continue to embrace and exceed the vision of the pioneers in pursuit of the greater achievements that are ahead for the organization. CXC in its 50th year, I believe, the framers of the CXC project must be proud of the achievements it has accomplished in a relatively short time and the impact that it has had on Caribbean and the Caribbean educational landscape. The, the impact has gone much further than originally intended by the framers, I believe. That is to prepare syllabuses and to set examinations based on these syllabuses and to issue certificates and diplomas. Today, CXC offers a comprehensive suite of qualifications, 
which cater to learners of different ages, interests, and abilities. The training of teachers, technical services to ministries of education, statistical data processing services, item writing training, psychometric training, provision of learning support materials. What an incredible achievement in this short period of time. So you've moved from offering five subjects at the, at the CXC, CSEC level, at your first sitting in 1979, to now offering 35 subjects, 46 units at the CAPE level, that's the Caribbean Advanced Proficiency Examination level, and more than 100 standards in the Caribbean Vocational Qualification level. The Caribbean Certificate of Secondary Level Competence, CCSLC, and the latest addition, the Caribbean Primary Exit Assessment, CPEA. The CAPE New Generation subjects are linked directly to the economies of the region. The list includes digital media, logistics and supply chain operations, entrepreneurship, tourism, performing arts, agricultural science, physical education and sport, green engineering, animation, and game design and financial services studies. What a range. Currently, design technology and biotechnology are being developed. And I know that work has begun on artificial intelligence and robotics. These are all necessary if we are to succeed in growing the economies in the region and improving the standard of living for all Caribbean people. This is a good juncture to pause and to take stock. We are at a historical juncture in the Caribbean when we must take careful stock of who we are as a people and where we must go. And so we're there with you, CXC. So much has happened internationally in the global economy, in society, and in technology. And so much has happened on the regional front as well. That necessitates deep reflection and our options for of our possibilities. Sir Hillary, I know you're on the forefront of that. So, and I know you'll talk more about that in your reflections. I reflect on the, the, the notion of the ideal Caribbean person and uh, which is a CARICOM construct and CXC's role in achieving that goal. We're a good way along the way but we cannot rest. I believe continuous self-assessment must be undertaken to ensure the relevance that we talked about registrar in the assessment systems as we go forward. And so let me applaud you, pioneers, as CXC continues to implement its, vi to implement its vision to assure human resource competitiveness in the Caribbean and I want to also applaud you for your willingness to innovate. We noted how you pivoted during the pandemic when we had difficulties across the region. We noted how you pivoted when there was a volcanic eruption in one of our sister territories and how you managed that to the benefit of our Caribbean people. So as you know, the government of Jamaica believes that Education, the structured harnessing of the creative and elective intellectual talents of the Jamaican people is the way forward in getting the nation to compete effectively in a modern globalized economy. Our nation's transformation must be underpinned by corresponding pursuits in education. It is clear that the continued development of the Jamaican economy can only happen through intellectual enablement of our people. The Caribbean Examinations Council is helping this to happen. In closing then, I say, I extend sincere congratulations for achieving this noteworthy milestone, your 50th anniversary milestone. Very best wishes to you and very best wishes to our pioneers as you continue to help us chart the future. Thank you, and may God continue to bless you all. Thank you, Mrs. Dwyer.
There is no CXC without the ministries of education around the region. Wouldn't you agree? And so we are grateful for the support of the ministry. Now, do you remember my remarks earlier? It is your story, my story. It is the Caribbean story. But there can be no story without storytellers. And that is why we are here. CXC at 50, the pioneer's viewpoint. Now, to help us appreciate the story, we've invited a chief storyteller himself to speak to our storytellers. Let me introduce you to our moderator for this morning. Cliff Hughes is one of Jamaica's most respected and admired broadcast journalist, an award-winning journalist. He began his broadcasting career in July 1986 at Radio Jamaica. As a sports reporter and producer, he moved quickly up the ranks. Within four years, he had risen to the position of chief sub-editor and presenter in a highly skilled and competitive broadcast news environment at Jamaica's oldest communications group. Now see if you can spot the link to CXC here. Mr. Hughes won the prestigious British Foreign and Commonwealth Sir Edgerton Richardson Scholarship in 1990 to pursue postgraduate studies in communications policy at City University in London. He left City University with a postgraduate diploma. Mr. Hughes graduated with an upper second class honors degree in mass communications and social sciences from the University of the West Indies Mona campus in 1986. Prior to that, he graduated at the top of his teacher education class of 1982 at Excelsior Community College. From there, he taught geography, social studies, and government and politics at the GCE advanced level for six years. Cliff Hughes won the prestigious National Journalism Award, Journalist of the Year for two consecutive years in 2003 and 2004. His program, Impact with Cliff Hughes, won an Emmy Award from the National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences in the United States. Impact won the Emmy Award for the incisive, cutting edge cinematic interview, The Search for Answers, the Malvo Exclusive Insights. The award was presented in the category Outstanding Investigative Reports in 2003. Now we could stay all morning and speak about Mr. Hughes, but we won't. But ladies and gentlemen, please allow me to introduce our moderator for the storytelling session, Mr. Hughes. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, to all of our listeners and viewers joining us on air and online and nationwide, 90FM and our social media platforms across the world. When the call came for me to do this session, I started to reflect on where I was, what, what was I doing in 1979, 44 years ago, in preparation for writing my school leaving exams. And as we can all attest to, that can be a very traumatic experience. <laughs> it is one pregnant with anxiety, and sense that, am I ready or not? I was at Excelsior in 1979. It was a year of ferment, social and political turmoil, economic challenges, 
a Jamaica that was then entering its 18th year of independence, political independence. It was the period of the 1970s, 1970s, when we were at the peak of the ideological struggle in Jamaica. We were a country virtually at war with ourselves, politically and otherwise. We were going to <coughs> high school at the time when you could not escape or hide from what was happening in Jamaica. Mountain View Avenue was a hotbed of political, should I say rivalries or war? <laughs> and, uh, but it was the best and the worst of times. Looking back as a student, it was the best and worst of times. Yes, you were learning about not only yourself, but your country and your world. And uh, it was a time when we had fun, yes? But we were also challenged as young Jamaicans. And when I look around me, Sir Roy, I met you long ago. <laughs> <laughs> reading, making of the West Indies. Maureen, I didn't get an A, but I got a B. I got a credit for history, <laughs> right? But it is an absolute privilege to sit in such august company with Sir Roy. And then the other giant of the period, Irene Walter. Yes? The history of CXC cannot be written without these giants. And I want to say, on, and of course, Professor Neville Ying, on behalf of that initial first cohort of Caribbean men and women. We're no longer boys and girls. We're now Caribbean men and women who have found our place inside and outside of Caribbean society. Thank you so much. Professor Ying, Mrs. Walt, and Sir Roy. Thank you so much. <clears throat> this morning it is my job to really get them to talk, to reflect about what was that period like forging, giving birth to CXC. This idea started only 10 years after independence in Jamaica, a little earlier about Barbados gained independence in 66, Trinidad in 66, 62 as well, as well, beg your pardon, and we were, we were a fledgling, small, vulnerable island states trying to find our footing in the world. We didn't know where we were going. We had a dream. We had an idea. Yeah. So, I'm going to begin with Professor Ying. The first steps, starting in 1972. The anxieties, the self-doubt. Talk to us. Thank you very much, Cliff. Uh, can you hear me on the mic? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, Cliff, I'm going to start back a little early because you said it's storytelling time. And you'll see why I start at a certain point. In 1969, I joined the Ministry of Education as co-director of a national mathematics project which was led by Dr. Phyllis McPherson Russell from the Institute of Education at UWI, Mr. Yuma Solomon uh, from the Ministry of Education, and myself. And 
My job interview went like this. The interview was conducted by one Euclid King, who the older people would know is a Barbadian, but a mathematician par excellence. And the interview went like this. Neville, you are interested in this job? Yes. Can you start on September 1st? Yes. See you then. Oh. <laughs> That was and it. Those of you who know Euclid, that's his style. He was very precise and very to the point. But through that project, I met two very important persons that my life would intersect with. One was Desmond Brooms, who later became a member of the Technical Advisory Committee for Measurement and Evaluation. And Errol Furlong, who became Chief Education Officer in Trinidad. And you can understand why I started that story, because you don't understand why your life intersects with other people's lives. Now, unfortunately for Moss, his mother was ill. So here was I, a young officer, not even one year yet at the Ministry of Education, and was selected to go to San Diego in California to train a battery of Peace Corps volunteers so that we should scatter them across the island and improve the teaching of math from early childhood right up to college level. Now, why did I mention that period? Because it was the first time I actually met Rex Nettleford. And Rex mesmerized those aspiring Peace Corps persons to come to Jamaica by speaking for one hour without any notes and use dance to explain to them that the Jamaican culture will, will absorb them or they will absorb the Jamaican culture. But I also met some, psycho some psychologists and each week we had to prepare a psychological report on each volunteer. And the psychologist said to me, Neville, you're a mathematician but your report is very similar to mine. Why don't you consider the area of psychometrics? And that was what started my journey in that area. Mm. Fast forward to 1972. Wesley Powell had this great idea that he was going to introduce teacher training at Excelsior. Mm. And I was the officer that was asked to go over there, and based on my recommendations, that's how Excel started teacher education. In fact, I've written an article on it, it's in the torch, and I've submitted it to the National Library of Jamaica for historical reasons. So Cliff, I knew a lot about Excelsior. Yeah. <laughs> and in fact, I give my students now that I teach transformation leadership, Wesley Powell to study as one of the persons who transformed the education system in Jamaica. But before that, I knew about Wesley Powell's work because Wesley Powell decided that to put Excelsior on the map, he would take students who passed the third Jamaica local exam, put them in Excelsior, and in one year they could do senior Cambridge, and the other year they would do higher schools. So Wesley was one of, to me, one of the pioneers. In 69, Edwin Allen started what was called junior secondary schools. And it was funded by the World Bank, and the schools had to be timetabled in a certain pattern following the World Bank. As a math person, I was charged with going to every school from Westmoreland right back to St. Thomas. And that's how I knew Jamaica, and that's how I got introduced to technical vocational education and subjects which will now become an important part of CXC's, you know, portfolio of examinations that they offer. In 72 also, I went into a period of depression because my job went like this. I went to the ministry twice. PS is here, she can understand that. The first day of the month to tell them what I'm going to do and the last day of the month to come and collect my check and write up my traveling. One morning morning I came in and I saw a note on my desk. With immediate effect, 
report to room 304. Well, if you just know that room through, I mean, the third floor is where everything happens. That's where you have the minister, the minister of state, the permanent secretary, the chief planner. So from that time, I was desk bound. But I was now spotted, later on I found out, as somebody of the future, and they put me to be in what was called the inner management group. And that inner management group consisted of the permanent secretary, the minister, the minister of state, and the chief education officer. And it was that time that I was now privy to the discussions about CXC. And all these brave Caribbean leaders decided that they were going to replace Cambridge and London O-levels with a Caribbean-centric examination. And so that was my first encounter. For the youngsters listening, Professor Ying, Cambridge, senior Cambridge, O levels. Tell us a little bit more about where those came from. All of those came from the UK. Mm -hmm. They were United Kingdom examining bodies, like the Cambridge Syndicate, as it was called, and so on. So the good thing about by being involved in that discussion, when they were just at that point of making this very dramatic decision about CXC being the exams that are going to replace, mm -hmm. you know, Cambridge and London. I was offered a government scholarship, and it triggered in my mind, I was free to select where, what I wanted to study. And strategically, I said to myself, CXC is going to need somebody in measurement and evaluation in the future. So I selected that area to study. It's now called psychometrics. Mm -hmm. And that took me off to the University of Maryland. And I showed you a letter that was written by Sir Florizel Gospel in October 1972, which says, here's a young man that we want to be a leader in the Ministry of Education. Take good care of him. All right, fast forward. I came back home in 1975. And a young lady called me. Her name was Irene Walter. Now, I met Irene in 1964. We were in the same class at UWI. We were from the famous batch of the class of 1967. Now, Irene, as you know, when she asks you to do something, it's not a request, it's an order. She says, Neville, we're going to start up CXC, and we need somebody to run the first item writing workshop in Barbados. And I want you to come down. Now, understand that you're a historian and you talk a lot about the UK and one of the colonial things I liked was that they left a rule that after study, you should get six weeks recreation leave. <laughs> so I was on six week recreation leave and Irene Walter called me. I said, this lady must be crazy. I want to enjoy my leave. So I said, Irene, where's this place? And she said, it's called Barbados. Now, I've never been to Barbados before. But to entice me, she said, the item writing workshop is going to be at Sam Lord's Castle. <laughs> now, Sam Lord's Castle was the creme de la creme of the hotels in Barbados. It had a lovely beach, a lovely tennis court. And so I said to Irene very later, it wasn't your convincing argument that made me start out with CXC. It was that I thought I was going on a line. <laughs> there was a beach. And there was tennis, which I liked. All right. And so, so that's how I started the first item writing workshop with examiners from across the Caribbean who were teachers and set out everything called overall grades, descriptors. And CXC was getting into a very revolutionary thing called profile grades. And the first meeting we had with the examiners, I remember at the garrison, the first question the examiners asked me is, where are the descriptors for the grades? And I said, we are going to create them. And you're talking about the Garrison Savannah? Yes, the Garrison Savannah. Not the Garrison down the road. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> and that was where my journey with CXC began. Yes. But at the same time, Aubrey Phillips, who was then Minister of State, was a Jamaica rep on the council. And then I succeeded Aubrey Phillips. Yes. And so I had to multitask. I was technical advisor to CXC. 
I was the Jamaica's rep on CXC, and I was one of the three-person team with Tom Christie and David Beckles, who would now select the first computer system and computers for the CXC exams. Good point on which to pause. Let me go to the Irene era now. Yes? She can pick up our story. Yes. In 1974, she was appointed the first pro-registrar of CXC in charge of the Administrative and Operational Center for the Western Zone Office located in Jamaica. You also became virtually the voice and face of those early days for CXC. Tell us, what was it like in terms of the public's acceptance, if not the key stakeholders in education, like the principals, the parents, the self-doubt? How much of a struggle that was to gain acceptance? Thank you very much, Cliff. That journey in 1974 started in, at the university. I was the assistant registrar in charge of student affairs and a very cushy, easy job. <laughs> <laughs> and so Roy Marshall summoned me to his office one day and said to me, here is an advertisement from the Cabinet Examinations Council. Please apply for the post. <laughs> well, you don't ignore the vice chancellor, but in fact I did. <laughs> and two days after the closing of the applications, he asked Joyce Biles to summon me to say, where is the application? Well, you know, of course, you had to write the application. And, um, and then I forgot about it. And about nine months later, I was summoned to an interview offered the job. And CXE negotiated with, with the council, with the CXE negotiated with the university to have me start one month after. So the 1st of August, 1974, I turned up in 9 Tobago Avenue, a building occupied by the Integrity Commission, Horace Patterson and Mr. Aikman were there. And was shown two rooms, a desk and a chair. And that is how my life at CXC started. I called the registrar and he said, I wish you to be in Barbados next week. And I complied. And in Barbados that week he said, in the next two weeks, please prepare to go to West Africa <laughs> to see, uh, review the, the West African Examinations Council was operated between Cambridge and West Africa. It was not autonomous. Um, the, the British set the examinations. They allowed um, the papers to be marked by, in West Africa. But this was a model that Cambridge was offering us, a joint arrangement in which they, they dominated and we were the, the deliverers of this program. Mm -hmm. Well, thank God for people like Roy O'Shea <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Dennis Irvin, because we actually visited the UK and said, thank you, but no. Now, Faced with it, in August, I was appointed um, pro-registrar. In December, it was decided that we were going to do five examinations in 1979. And the Western Zone was going to be responsible for the development of all syllabuses and the training of the markers. Here, then, I must pay tribute to the Jamaican to the Caribbean teachers, names, I want to mention two persons um, particularly. Mrs. Aiken of Queens and Mr. Wesley Powell of Excelsior, who offered their students as the guinea pigs in that first 
examinations. I traveled, uh, never said he, 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 he traveled in Jamaica, so did I. I mean, I was on the road almost every week going to each school to explain this new um, examination. But in fact, I saw, we had, although the people were a little they're diffident, are you, are you going to be able to manage it? They were very supportive, mm. very, very supportive. And, uh, principals, uh, teachers, principals, and parents. teachers, principal teachers, and then I was thrown with parents. But in fact, the parents usually take their advice from teachers. So once you convince teachers, yes. then you had the parents behind you. And what were the five subjects? I remember doing math, yes. English. What were the other three? Geography, history. Uh, and integrated science. Okay. Yes. yes. Yeah. There's a story about integrated science that I think must be told because Neville was there. <laughs> um, uh, Flo Commission was the, the, the panel convener, and uh, um, the idea was to combine all three subjects physics, ma uh, physics, biology, and chemistry into one syllabus. And when we we prepared the syllabus document, the proposal, and went to subsec. It was an uproar. The teacher said, no way could we teach these three um, science subjects. And so we had to repair, and that was one of the sleepless nights because we, we just could not leave St. Lucia without the approval of subsec. The compromise was that we would offer a double award for integrated science, although it, it, we combined chemistry, biology, and physics. Mm -hmm. What was the resistance like from industry? Um, first of all, let me just say this to you. Jamaica did not sign the agreement in 1972. Jamaica and Trinidad refused to sign. Why? Huh? <laughs> it, it, let, 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 let's hear from Sir Roy. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Sir Roy? It wasn't ready to be presented, and they were afraid that we might do it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. I, um, there was a change in government between 72 and 73. In Jamaica? In Jamaica. Yes. And Michael Manley signed it. Oh. Michael Manley signed the agreement. So we had a supplementary agreement signed in 1973 by Trinidad and Jamaica. And that's how Jamaica became part of the Caribbean Examinations Council. They had been in the discussions all along. Roy and Faye Saunders were the representatives. Of the and JTA? Thin? Yes, yes. And, um, and there was support for the Caribbean Examinations Council but there was not government support. In fact, I'll tell you this, there was, the government of Jamaica at the time brought in a Mr. Carmen. Mr. who? Carmen. From Cambridge. From Cambridge. Yes. And they sent Mr. Carmen as the representative to the meeting in, in Montserrat. Yes. And therefore he did not vote to have yeah. In fact, there was some thought of conducting our own examinations that the Jamaica government, the Jamaican government would establish its own examinations rather than join with the Caribbean wow. Examinations Council. Take us into those halls. What was it like? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, tell us a story. Always <laughs> 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 Look here. Uh, one huh? Those halls, meaning okay. those meetings, yes. rooms, yes. tell us a story. Yes. Well, let me tell you, let me tell, let me tell you one more, Mr. Carmen. Moderate. Let me tell you one more, Mr. Carmen. Huh? Mr. Carmen. Uh, let me hear, pro, pro, Roy. I, I say, keep Neville quiet. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, yes, Irene, tell us, what was it? Like no, I'm really came to Jamaica. 
That is when I knew about the British tenacity. Okay. The permanent secretary decided yeah, not yeah, to meet yeah, him. Go ahead, go ahead. No, go ahead, Prof. And what he did was he took his files and he sat outside the permanent secretary's door. Yeah. Permanent secretary passing, good morning, good afternoon. And after three days, he finally spoke to Mr. Clark. That was in 1972. Go ahead, Irene. Yes. Oh? <laughs> oh? Um, Mr. Carmen and the Permanent Secretary. Um, we dare not forget Faye Saunders. A giant. Faye Saunders carried the torch for the Jamaican teachers and succeeded in convincing the Jamaican government that we should be part of the Caribbean Examinations Council. Um, as I said, Sir Roy and Faye were the representatives at that monster meeting in 1969 that developed the monster accord which was signed in 1972. Yes. <sighs> Why, why, why do you tell us? <laughs> She's sad. Why are you going to No, no, no. Trinidad, Trinidad was not, Trinidad was not supportive. Yes. Initially, of joining the Caribbean Examinations Council. Uh -huh. I, I recall, <clears throat> and particularly, I am not sure about the influence of the Roman Catholic Church, but I do remember that when we had a meeting in San Fernando, we did not have the support, because uh, the, the Roman Catholics have a lot of schools. We did not have the support of the, the teachers, the, the, uh, the institution, the Roman Catholic Church, and the teachers. It was a real battle. And let me then say, again, we need to honor somebody like Anna Mahes the principal of St. Augustine Girls School, who threw with faith, it, it was like a mafia, um, Esther Burroughs, Anna Mahes, and, um, and, and Faith Saunders. Mm -hmm. Those three women took the message of a Caribbean Examinations Council to their territories. Thank you. Professor Auger, Mr. Yes, sir. Will you allow me to sit for a second? Yes, sir. Put my glasses on? Sure. <laughs> it says in my hand, 2-1, what is one of your early memories you have of sexy? Can I part from the form of the speakers before me? Sure. I'm only called upon to have one early memory. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. I have one early memory. It is the one that comes from being a historian. <laughs> am I, am I, yeah, am yes, I, am you're mic. Yeah. It comes from being a historian. So I'm forced to announce what I hope would later take place when I tried to persuade a smaller group than this one that we have to publish what have we have heard so far from these two, everybody talks about giants, giants. <laughs> and if I don't do this, and it comes, I, if you will permit me, I, I wondered why did I survive to this age? I belong to a religion in which you are warned, a warning I, he, I didn't heed. You are warned that at death you will be the, in the face of the, your maker who will ask you, what did you do whilst you were alive? And I thought I was fearful of that question because I didn't live a life as a youth that uh, 
allowed me to think that I could face the God that I believed in uh, with any confidence of being pointed to hair instead of hair. Yeah. <laughs> when I listen to these two giants, I'm beginning to have some inkling of why he hasn't called me for judgment yet. <laughs> <laughs> because as a historian, I'm finding that perhaps the clue lies in getting these two people and others in order on, on, in writing on a page or in print on a page. So one of the, the things that I'm releasing that I had as a secret in my head is that I want to persuade the council that we have to spend some money producing in, in some form, preferably pamphlet form, like uh, the ones we produce for the Elsa Gabaya lectures at the university, that people can buy because they'll be, mm -hmm. the, the, um, the cost will be what they can afford in an orderly fashion, because we need to adjust some dates between these storytellers. <laughs> okay, then. <laughs> now, I'm interested in the dates because I don't know the whole heap of middle class, decent people, but I'll, I'll be known to take risks with verbal states. <laughs> Some of this conversation reminds me that it is fair to compare CXE with the sorts of discussions of abortion and pills and the, the Registrar General's office and the sorts of DNAs where paternity uh, is, is being discussed. Now, since we have a whole lot of decent people here, this is <laughs> the, the analogy. The analogy, the analogy has to be agreed to be secret in this room and only to help you see that there are many fathers, mothers, and we, we need, in the sake of the people threatening DNAs to establish paternity, <laughs> we, we need to have somebody whom you can trust. Okay. <laughs> to provide an orderly, because no, nobody is lying. That isn't what I'm saying, and I hope it's clear. It is, it's, which is what provoked me to, to come up with the current uh, discussion in the Jamaican Greener, which I read, and the Observer, uh, of what are the consequences of DNA paternity when you're giving men uh, paternity leave as mm. well as women. Yes. And, and fellas are, are saying, me too. And therefore, they want to know, who was it? Yes. <laughs> so I So may I ask you then? Can, no, 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 not yet. Can I ask you then to take notice that I will be, uh, where is Wesley? There. Uh, right. Wesley, I want you to take notice that I, the circumstances which, for which you are responsible for this, I will have to bring to you a formal request that we set aside some money for a, 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 an orderly historian's version of how it happened. Okay. Yes, right? Because I'm only asked, and I'm, I'm perfectly capable of one memory. The, because the memory really is, is what underlies this. CXE emerged bit by bit accidentally. And I, I want, without hogging this, to tell you that it, it began with my life as a postgraduate student, student of the University of St. Andrews where I did my undergraduate degree and was a 
awarded a PhD. So since I wanted to work on the Caribbean, and the St. Andrews PhD was neither in terms of monetary or well, historical material available in St. Andrews, which gets us money from being on the side of the North Sea, which it can make a claim in the warmest part of Scotland in the season when the university closes. And the university takes it seriously. Uh -huh. And the university takes this seriously. So it has no hesitation at all in throwing out St. Andrews students early to make room for, in the halls for the tourists it wants to attract. <laughs> so I was forced to go to London, leave this house, but I exist on 19 pounds. Right? Impossible. Right. So that is how I got into the Institute of London, uh, uh, London the Institute of Education at the University of London, because my supervisor was a Scot, William Macmillan, who had just written, or not just, he had written it one year earlier, a warning from the West Indies, mm -hmm. which was one year before the strike broke out. When the strikes fund the whole Caribbean from Guyana to Jamaica, and I think the Bahamas. Right. Penguin, which was then the pioneer in the paper book industry, you could buy a paper book, Penguin, for nine, nine pence, or a shilling, or some absurd price of this price. But Milton persuaded them to print warning from the West Indies. This would have been what decade? The late, mid 30s, late uh, uh, like, yes. 30, the labor revolts, yeah, yeah. just before the workers' the strike, revolt, just yes. before the strikes. Yes. Right. So that is why the, the title, "Warning from the West Indies." Yes. Miller, uh, who was one of the South African Rhodes scholars, mm -hmm. which incidentally or reminds me always. So you're saying, CXC started then. How so? Yeah, yes, if you think of pills and non-use of pills and rubber and non-use of rubber and consequences. Yes. 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 So because, you, because as a consequence of being in the institute, when the Institute of Commonwealth Studies began, mm -hmm. I used to go there because Macmillan said, you can't exist on 19 pounds from the University of St. Andrews. But we can get money from the colonial office on the basis of the consequences of the strike and the basis of mm. setting up right. And they were bound to give you one. And Macmillan had been involved with the marriage of the Zulu princess and the, conse the consequences for the commonwealth of the, of the Zulu beating of the, the girl for daring to think mm -hmm. as a princess of the Zulus, she going go and go So take us back, Professor, to those debates, those contentious discussions well, about whether we should go on our own to leave behind Cambridge we, and... That is why I'm daring to work the, this Middle propriety class here, daring to refer them to the current discussion in the newspapers. We didn't reach there yet. Mm -hmm. What happened was I was downstairs of the institute having tea from the record office when I found on the table that I was using a proposal from Cambridge asking me to consider a, a paper in West Indian history for schools. Mm. Now, I was not interested in history for schools, in fact. So when I was being persuaded to be a teacher, I didn't want to be a teacher. I said, no, I'm, I'm going to go into law. Here was I being like, 
So I wrote saying, uh, what you uh, presented me with is not West Indian history, it's just the affairs that of the Europeans in the Caribbean. So to my surprise, they, that I had no contact, cold contact with Cambridge at all, but I, the, whoever was operating there and wrote mm -hmm. back saying, well, write us one. So that is how I got into the business, okay? Oh. So then I went to Mona on the basis of the award from the University of St. Andrews, mm -hmm. and also because 19 pounds couldn't exist. Very well. And Macmillan thought that the colonial office would be glad uh, to provide me with, uh, with some extras. And to his surprise, they told him no. Why? Because the, the Moyne Commission, right, that had been involved, had specifically instructed the colonial office to, to, to appoint somebody to teach Caribbean, well, they call it West Indies history then, uh, uh -huh. at the Mona. And they replied to Macmillan that they had already appointed one, and the university did not need more than one. The one was Elsa Gobaya. Yes. So Elsa Gobaya was the first appointment. Elsa that didn't even have a PhD, mm -hmm. but she was only person available in the university oh, system of England to whom they could appoint. May I, may I go back to Professor Ying? 50 years on. Yeah, and we're, we're going to wrap up. I realize they're behind. Oh. 50 years on, Professor Ying. The major lessons learned. Okay, let me skip an important part of this conversation. I've analyzed the lessons from six years. All right, hold on. Uh, yes, Professor Beckham. Yeah, I think there's a, another part of the story that has to be told. And this is a moment where I enter the narrative. Yes. The fight for the kid. <laughs> that is part two. Your mic. Right. Yes. So part two. More of the struggle. Mm -hmm. Was the CXC exam had now been consolidated. And by the way, let me, let me say before I begin, when I entered that narrative, I was a huge Irene fan. I want you to know that. I mean, I fell in love with her mind and her style. We were good friends from day one. Yeah. Because this organization, like many organizations, were dominated by men. And Irene, with her elegance and her eloquence and her sharp mind and her skill, she transcended almost everything. Mm. So I entered with this transcendental woman in charge and large and in charge with style. <laughs> yes. Okay, and that's important. That's a very important, yes. important observation. So I entered at the moment when the time had come now to move to the KIP, to replace the Cambridge A-level and those other issues. And there was tremendous resistance in some countries that were very comfortable with their Cambridge A-level. And I was recruited to, um, to help to argue the public case for the KIP. And I would go around the region making speeches about the need to move to the next level, which was the KIP. And importantly, that um, I would then become the convener of a team to write the CAPE examination syllabus. Mm -hmm. So I was told that they're going to give you a team of 10 historians and you will assemble and prepare the CAPE syllabus. Not at Sam Lawrence Castle, <laughs> <laughs> but, but right here in the Pegasus. Ah. Right here in the Pegasus, I, I had a team of 12 historians and we spent three days in here uh, developing the conception for the A-level. And then having done that, back through the region again, persuading schools and ministries to transition. Now, what about industry? We keep on forgetting industry, no, the forgetting reaction it. of you, industry. You may be forgetting it, but I'm not forgetting it. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, yeah. the, the industry made, well, the, the teachers, teachers and industry 
made a case for being a, uh, a membership on the council. Oh. Uh, the, the decision was not to involve them at the regional level, but in the national committees. Mm. And there was, there was a national committee in each territory. Neville uh, was, uh, of course, Neville has a building named after him uh, with all that money that he, uh, that he um, <laughs> earned from CXC entrance fees. But that was where the, 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 the idea that put, make your input in at the national level because it would come up through mm. the system. Yeah. Were you finished, Sir Hillary? But I should say there were some fascinating intellectual debates going on at that time about, certainly in respect of the, the history, mm -hmm. the Cape. Parents and teachers were of the view that it's going to be only a West Indian content um, A-level equivalent. Mm -hmm. We had to persuade them, no, the, the CXC Cape is going to be a world history examination. And we had to make some arguments like, you would never understand the Russian Revolution unless you understand the Haitian Revolution. Mm. <laughs> and therefore, you had to expose the kids to the journey, the American Revolution, the Haitian Revolution, the Russian Revolution, and, and take them through all of those conversations of world history. Mm -hmm. So uh, looking at the, the world, the Atlantic world especially, and crafting a narrative through that history so that young students could understand the making of the modern world. Mm -hmm. So we were building, we were building on the platform that Sir Roy had built with the, with the CXC. We, we did the Cape and together, I would say that they really constituted a first class set of examinations. Mm -hmm. I think no doubt about it. And at the time of our construction, we were very sensitive to the world that Irene had built, uh, Roy, of course, and then came Lucy Stewart after. And uh, there was a very strong team that was intellectually focused on giving the Caribbean people the best, and also proving to the world that our syllabuses were as good as any in the world, and we could prove it. And that was the target we have set for ourselves. And I think we achieved it. I think we have some excellent syllabuses now at both levels. Yeah. I just wanted to make one point. <coughs> at the time when we were debating whether six he would be accepted internationally, Stephen Fisher, who is an author who prepares material identifying the matriculation requirements of the United States universities, affirmed in his book, that the four general proficiencies and two basic proficiencies satisfied the requirements for entry to an American institution. Mm. Since 1979, at a time when there were some doubters here, yeah. Stephen Fisher, an authority on it, included that in his book. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right, I think we, I think, Neville, final comment from you, observation from you, Neville. We're over time. How much time do I have for a final comment? <laughs> you have 15 huh? seconds. Huh? 15 seconds. Well, let's do the radio thing. Yes. There are two major points I wanted to make in this discussion, which we obviously don't have time to do. The first is what lessons can we learn from the early days? And secondly, what are the new pathways for CXC going forward? With respect to the first one, there are two sets of points I'd like to make. One is that CXC set out to build an entire human resource network. And that network consisted of two sets of people, specialists in measurement and evaluation and persons who brought to the table education philosophy, and Caribbean cultural identity. And those two things together mixed with how we produced the exam. The second thing about um, the early days was that 
they use three what I call servant leadership competencies. Emotional intelligence, because there was a lot of fear and concerns. Then you had strategic thinking, which is how will we make CXC sustainable and resilient in the future? And thirdly, conversations, discontinuous dialogue across countries, across groups. And lastly now, what is the future? My recommendation, which I've set out in the book, is that CXC must now respond to some new things on the horizon. The first one, of course, is the digitalization and digital transformation of the workplace. The second is the impact of climate departure and global warming, which is now forcing all organizations to pay attention to the environment, the social issues, and governance. And lastly, the key aspect of education transformation, which is holistic education. And with respect to that, CXC now has a business opportunity because there's going to be need for a wider variety of psychometric measures, especially those dealing with emotional intelligence and personality. And those have not yet been developed and aptitude tests. And so and CXC has a golden opportunity to move into those areas. Professor Neville Yang and uh, UA Vice Chancellor, current CXC Chairman, yes? You have the closing words, sir. Oh, um, well, the closing words would be, the closing words would be um, projection into the future. And we have done a fair amount of historicizing and we, we understand what we have achieved. And uh, as we have heard earlier, we have good reasons to be proud of our tenacity and, and our vision. It wasn't easy then at all uh, for Roy and Irene and, and their contemporaries to dig, to dig in and do the right thing for Caribbean people. It was tough, it was tough. The future is going to be equally challenging. Um, there are some new demands that are emerging from societies across the region. Some governments uh, have different views as to how things should go. Uh, we have put in place a ministerial, a ministerial forum in which each year we meet with all of the ministers of education to talk about the future. And that's the institution we have built now. I believe that will guide CXC uh, certainly in the, next, in the next decade because we don't always want to be uh, out there in the public with all of the misunderstandings and crossfires. But if we, if we can domesticate, domesticate that within an institution, then we can fix it there and then and roll it out. So I think we're looking to uh, a good future. I think uh, all the ministers have recognized that this is a gold standard. We have to protect it. There was some negativity around the COVID management and some of the challenges of uh, of, of, of school children being unable to access digital information mm -hmm. and all of those kinds of issues, which are important. Mm -hmm. But the institution itself is in good shape. The relationship between the institution and the ministries, there is room for improvement. And that has to be the focus going forward. So I think all in all, I think uh, she actually can be proud of what it has done and achieved at 50. And I believe that we are in a good position to even build better, faster, better on that. So I'm very, very positive about the future. I'm sure we have reasons to be proud of the foundation on which we stand. Thank you. Sir Hilary Beckles. Thank you very much. <laughs> Professor Roy Auger, thank you very much. Irene, thank you very much. Professor Ying, thank you very much. Thank you. My job is done. My gosh, All right. Thank you so much. I think that's fine. I think that's quality television, and we are, we are broadcasting. We are streaming live, so we do appreciate the conversation. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Hughes, Professor Ying, Mrs. Walter, Sir Roy Auger, 
and Professor Sir Hilary Beckles. I hope we were all taking notes and I hope we will all leave here as better storytellers. We do have some tokens that we would like to present to our, our distinguished storytellers. And we are going to invite We, we want these persons to be on standby, right? We will be making a presentation to our past chairman, Sir Roy, and we'll ask our current chairman, Sir Hillary. Oh, our former chairman. Oh no, we, we have we have Sir Kenneth Hall um, with us here to deliver this presentation, this token to our past chairman, Sir Roy. Now, if you didn't hear, Sir Roy proudly said he is more, more capable of standing on his own. And at CXC at 50, we're very happy for that. So we thank you, our past chairman, the most honorable Professor Sir Kenneth Hall, thank you very much. Our next presentation will be one from our current registrar and CEO, Dr. Wayne Wesley, CXC at 50. Very nice. Thank you so much, Dr. Ali. Now, our final presentation will be to Mr. Hughes. Thank you both. So as we come to the end of our program, we want to thank you once again for joining us for CXC at 50, the Pioneer's Viewpoint. Did you enjoy today's session? <laughs> All right, but now we want to invite our pro registrar and deputy CEO, Dr. Eduardo Ali, to move our vote of thanks. Dr. Ali, please. Uh, I think it's uh, fitting to say good afternoon, and I'm honored to be here today to have witnessed this event um, and to hear all of the wonderful recollections of the past. I think we have to chronicle our past to build a vibrant future, and we are indeed grateful to all of you for having joined us today. And so as I conclude, um, I would like to say on behalf of the chairman and members of council, executive management, and the staff of the Caribbean Examinations Council. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been given the honor to bring this ceremony to a close. And therefore, I am going to give the vote of thanks to acknowledge all who have made contributions to this event to make it successful. I'd first like to thank our syllabus and curriculum development senior manager, Ms. Jodine Williams, who took us into the presence of God and would have given us an opportunity to know why we are here today. Thank you, Ms. Jodine Williams, for delivering the invocation. And she blessed us with uh, not just the proceedings, but also set the tone that was required for today's event. I also want to give our Master of Ceremonies, Mr. Travis Bartley, uh, here at CXC, uh, the gratitude for calmly and judiciously and eloquently taking us through today's proceedings. In his absence, Professor Sir Hilary Beckles, Chairman of CXC, someone whom I have grown to be fond of in my career, thank you for your continued steadfast leadership of the Council 
and for bringing the opening remarks today, which provided us with insights as to Caribbean integration and the historical um, archives that would have allowed us to understand why we are here. We are indeed grateful to you, sir, for your remarks, for setting us, setting the stage. Our sincere gratitude to you, Dr. Wayne Wesley, Registrar and CEO, for your, not just your presence, but for your leadership in terms of putting this event together. We thank you, sir, for what you've said in terms of itemizing the, and chronologizing chronolog chronologizing the activities of the council over its history, but more importantly, recognizing all the leaders past and present for the contributions that they are making or have made to this wonderful organization. We also thank Mrs. Maureen Dwyer, Acting Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Education and Youth Jamaica, uh, for not just her presence, but her re insightful remarks, also and ensuring that we understood where we've come from, the role that Jamaica has played and continues to play in the context of a regional enterprise and a regional endeavor. Our sincere gratitude to Mr. Cliff Hughes. I'm not sure if he's in the room um, at this time, journalist and CEO of Nationwide News Network, who um, eloquently moderated our session today with our pioneers and would have masterfully taken us through the discourse helping us to create the narrative that was necessary for us to appreciate why we're here. And of course, the interactions with the pioneers who would have allowed for us to really get deeply into some of their own thoughts and their ideas and some of their own personal accounts, which I think helped us appreciate um, how we can vision for the future. We are indeed grateful to you, all featured guests today, starting with Sir Professor Roy Auger, who is our past chairman of CXC, and who would not remember me, but I sat in his Caribbean Civilization class, as well as his Caribbean History class at Mona Campus many years ago, and I had the opportunity of asking him a question at the end of the class, because I was having difficulty understanding some of what was being taught, because I was not, uh, 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 I did not have the fortune of having had Caribbean history in my secondary schooling. But I want to thank you, sir, because of what you have done then, it has created an appetite in me to look at regionalism and regional integration in the way that I do it now. Thank you, sir. I also want to congratulate and thank Mrs. Irene Walter, past pro registrar and registrar. There are so many great things the team here in Western Zone have said about you, and I now know why. Um, your leadership, your stick to itiveness, your intellectual capacity, I think, has taken uh, not just the Western Zone office really where it should be, but also you have you've led a strong team, and many of whom are still here with us today, and they are all grateful to see you in flesh with us today. And we want to really thank you for what you've done and what you're continuing to do for us. Professor Neville Ying, not just a past council member and chairman of the past chairman of the Overseas Examinations Commission. But sir, a leadership extraordinaire who has chronicled your ideas about servant leadership and transformational leadership and digitization in the Caribbean. Sir, we greatly appreciate all that you have done um, in the region in the past. But currently what you're doing with all the hats that I hear you're wearing, I think there's the region and Jamaica is very grateful to you for what you are doing currently. So I want to thank all of you ladies and gentlemen, for availing yourselves today, given your hectic schedules, given the very, ma very many things that you can do to join us to celebrate the 50th anniversary event. You are truly pioneers in all of your endeavors and in the CXE story, past and I dare say present and future. Uh, you've contributed to bringing a positive impact on countless Caribbean people in the region through the many things that you have done in the context of being chairman, registrar, pro-registrar, council members, persons who have been uh, examining committees, and persons who have led the measurement and evaluation movement in the region. We are indeed grateful to you for what you've done. Um, I'd like to thank um, also uh, the persons who've contributed along with me to make the presentation to the, of the tokens to all of you wonderful pioneers. 
starting with Professor Sir Hilary Beckles, who in absence, we have um, Professor Sir Kenneth Hall deputizing competently for him. Um, I know, sir, you had quite a little carry on the stage, but you did it masterfully. We want to thank you for being able to do that. Dr. Wayne Wesley, uh, Mrs. Eleanor McKnight, manager in the examinations and administration department, um, for availing yourselves to do that. What I'd also like to specially thank those specially invited guests, both in person and those of you who have joined us online, to be here with us today to attend the event, both physically and virtually. Uh, I would like to especially thank our streaming partners, Emerge Multimedia, and to the Jamaica Pegasus Hotel, who have provided this venue and have done all that is needed to ensure that our proceedings could have been executed. Gratitude extended to the members of the CXE team who are in this room, and I want to acknowledge them, notably uh, Ms. Sheena Balkaran, finance manager, who has quite a lot to do, but she has managed to be able to contribute to the organizing of this event. Thank you very much, Ms. Balkaran. I also want to thank our corporate communications team, which comprises a mix of persons who are in the headquarters currently in Barbados, as well as um, in here in Jamaica at the Western Zone office. Uh, to include Mr. Matthew Tull, our digital communications officer in Barbados currently, Ms. Uh, Foley and Tate, who is the public relations and marketing officer also there, and to Mr. Travis Bartley, whom you've met as our master of ceremonies today. But special mention must also be made to the executive assistant in the office of the registrar, Ms. Amril Gittens, who would have done all that she can do as usual behind the scenes to ensure that this happened, as well as our human resource coordinator, Mr. Marvin Spence. But as I bring the curtains down to a close, regrettably, I must say, I want to make just a brief remark, if I may, about the importance again of this event. As we've heard today, CXC, as an intergovernmental agency of CARICOM, as an educational bureaucracy in the region, as you've heard, masterfully working with ministries of education, the national committees, which you've heard of, and other regional entities, including CARICOM and the CARICOM Secretariat itself. Say it and the University of the West Indies, whom we have to recognize would have been part of this genesis of, the, of, the, of CXC, we are in a critical place in our trajectory, in our history, and in our intergovernmental and international relations. And so as a body that is poised in this transformational journey, if anything that we've learned today in this forum is that we must genuinely reposition CXE in our strategic intent, in our structure and manner of operating to become relevant and to continue to be impactful as we continue to serve the new generation of digital ready, agile, and skillable children, youth, and adult workers who are in this beautiful region that we have. We heard of the 16 territories plus and so, ladies and gentlemen, as we continue, I would like to thank all of you again for all that you've done, and all that you're continuing to do to be part of this regional thrust to build awareness, to bring sensitization, but also to build the capacity of our teachers, our students or learners, and the citizens whom we serve in this region. Ladies and gentlemen, have a great day. God bless all of you.